Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, going to be an episode entitled Answering the Second Critique of P. P. Kurosh. I don't know his first name. This time he's attacking our Berean testing of Paul as insulting Jesus and the apostles, and he claims it's blasphemy. And we're going to look at uh, today teaching about Acts 17, verses 11 to 12, where Luke himself says it's a more noble character, the Bereans, who tested Paul for apostasy, basically compared him to what the word of God had said before Paul. And then in Acts 21, 21, we'll see that James actually ordered Paul to disprove that Paul was an apostate. He actually, the word in Greek is, Paul, we've heard rumors, you're guilty of apostasy against Moses. We want you to now do these certain deeds to disprove that you are an apostate and in fact that you keep the law and Paul complies. And why does that, it is very material to why the Berean testing that's done in Acts 17 involves a Paul who is willing to give a false face undisputably in Acts 21. He then later says uh, he teaches a gospel of works worthy of repentance. That's in Acts 26. And then he says um, that he believes in all points of the law and the prophets. So we know that Paul, oh, that's in Acts um, 23. So we know he is in the book of Acts. He's giving a completely different impression in front of the of James. It's completely different. And this is post-crucifixion, by the way. That's going to be important completely different impression in front of James, in front of, in Acts 21. He's going to give a different impression in front of Luke, who's listening in in the trial in front of Festus and Agrippa in Acts 23. And he's going to give uh, King, uh, that's Festus, excuse me. And then in Acts 26, it's in front of Festus and King Agrippa. And that's where he says, I teach a gospel, I, that my message to the Jews, the Gentiles, is a gospel message of works worthy repentance. And we'll go through all that later. We're actually going to play a clip from a recent episode I did on Berean testing, uh, and I don't think I did that video with this ever seeing his first critique even. So I, this is going to be completely uh, neutralized from my actually responding to this, these two critiques by my taking a video that's unrelated, was done completely apart from this whole dispute with him. So I'm going to read you his, his uh, first and then his second uh, comments. And one of the reasons I'm reading these to you is those people who are testing Paul and have found him to be, like I showed you, he gives a false face in Luke, completely odds. He's hiding something. There is something he doesn't want Luke to know. And that's why these three passages I just was talking to you about are, are present, Acts 21, 23, and 26. He thinks Paul is on his side when Paul is definitely not in agreement with where Luke is going and where Luke's gospel. We'll, we'll get into that too. So, uh, again, be prepared if you're a, a fan of the principle that we need to be testing uh, Paul for validity against the word of God. That's a, that's, it's, that's a mandated test from God in Deuteronomy 13. Uh, it's also a mandated test in, in uh, Jesus, if you read his remarks about uh, in uh, Matthew 7, verses 21 to, and 20 to 23. That's where he's going to talk about people who teach anomia, who are apostates. And he's going to tell him, I never knew you. So, and that's ultimately our, our objective here at this channel, to help Christians who think they're following Christ, but they're actually been misled into somebody who defrauded Luke and gave him these false impressions that he's law compliant. He teaches the gospel of works worthy repentance and even trick, tricked uh, James to think that he was law compliant by doing this Nazarite vow in Acts 21. So this is a, a clear cut in, uh, and, and these, all of these activities are post, post, all of his epistles, major epistles, except the only major epistle that isn't is uh, uh, the book of Ephesians. So all the other major works have been done when you're seeing the Acts 21, 23, 26 period. Let's listen now to Mr. Kurosh's uh, uh, first comment. PhD, Systematic Christian Theology. Context is king when it comes to interpreting any text. Now, I've cited to him three texts. And those three texts are these, John 8, verses 30 to 47. That's where disciples, excuse me, where new believers in Christ, Jesus says, uh, if you continue in my word, so that means they've already started in his word, you, you now must become my disciples, and that will make you free of sin. And they don't agree. They don't want to do discipleship. They don't think they're in bondage. They don't, and Jesus says, if you're sinning, you're in bondage to sin, and they get angry at him. And, they, and then Jesus says, now you want to kill me. And then finally he says, you're the sons of the devil. So they went from being believers in Christ, refusing to be disciples, and then they become lost. And now they're, they're going to the devil. Definitely 
uh, anti-faith alone teaching. So he knows that and he never discusses it. He doesn't want to deal with that because his covenant theology says what? That I got all my atonement up front. I don't have to repent. It's faith alone. These passages from Jesus that contradict faith alone, those were believers who go to hell, that no longer applies. We now have the faith alone gospel from Paul. Same thing with Mark 9, 40, 42 to 47. It says, a believer in me who's ensnared in sin has only two choices, go to heaven, maimed, or hell whole. But when you put Paul in the mix, now you can go to heaven just by faith alone with no works, no repentance, no, no maiming of yourself. You can go to heaven unmaimed, <laughs> un, unrepentant. Repentance is advised, but don't not necessary. Don't think of it that way. That's what they want you to believe. So Mark 9, 42, 47 should no longer be taught. This is I've been taught that I've, many people have told me don't use Mark 9, 42, 47 anymore. It's no longer relevant. We're in a different dispensation. Same thing in Luke 18, 9 to 14. You have a uh, the uh, parable, not the parable, the story of Zacchaeus. He does a work. He promises, excuse me, he, he promises to do a repentance where he's going to give back everything he stole from the poor. And what is that? That that's not that's not faith alone. Jesus says this salvation has come this day to this house. And the Bishop James couldn't be more clear in 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 uh, that passage. He says even in the King James, uh, 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 justification is by uh, works and not by faith alone or faith only. It's translating the King James only. I don't know why it's still the word mono it means alone. So you're not justified by faith alone. You're justified by works. That's what Jesus teaches in the sheep and the goats. And that's exactly the passage that James is clearly quoting three different aspects of it about the, the taking care of the poor and the needy. And then Paul, just by the way, I mean, James slams faith alone also in uh, two verse 27. Because that's where he says the, the the demons believe. You know, you believe in God. That's good. Good for you to believe in God. But you know what? The demons believe in God. So that's not going to get him to heaven. See, so this is what uh, he's ignoring, and he knows this is a different dispensation. So with that in mind, listen to how he gets around. He's going to say, "I'm missing the context of the crucifixion." So let's see again what he's going to say. Context is king when it comes to interpreting any text. Violating context leads to false understandings of Jesus' teachings always. The interpretations provided in this video are very often out of the context of time or subject or the audience, and sometimes even all three combined. Example, when Jesus is speaking about forgiveness or being his disciples in the book of John, his words are pre-crucifixion. When he had not paid for our sins yet, exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. So that's to him the key difference. It's Jesus' death on the cross and, and his resurrection. That changed everything. All those, John, Mark, Matthew, those principles don't apply anymore. We're going to get our atonement all up front. That's covenant theology. And no repentance necessary as a result. But it's okay to do. Not prohibited, but it's not necessary. And according to Paul, it would lead to potential risk of boasting. So if you put all of these things together, you get the big picture. Within that context of time, salvation could not be by faith in his sacrifice yet. So I disagree. He, 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 his salvation was already prophesied in Isaiah 53. So if he's telling them he's going to do an atonement, why can't, why can't they accept it then? And then I'm going to plead the blood of Christ later. I know it's going to happen. And why wouldn't he teach them all these things? And why would he not? Why would he have spent? I got to just interject. Why would he spent the time teaching Matthew, Mark, and John if those principles are all going out the window in just a, less than a year? Why, why bother? And why get, send the Holy Spirit to lead them to, to remember everything he said unless if those things are going away the day he dies? But that's what, so he thinks I'm missing the context. I think he's not seeing the big picture. But that's neither here nor there. Let's keep going. But if you read the scriptures about salvation and justification after Christ completed his saving work on the cross, then in the post-crucifixion time and context, the concept of salvation by faith alone becomes the proper interpretation. In other words, the, the proper way of understanding the gospel now is changed. He's not saying that, but the context, he's saying a fact happened which changes everything, the fact of the crucifixion. And that's what uh, covenant theology teaches in the article I was critiquing by R.C. Sproul. Conclusion, salvation is by faith alone until you interpret the words of Jesus out of their context, out of the fact that it's post-crucifixion. So when you have a crucifixion, again, he's saying it changes everything. So that's how it started. And I, I did a, 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 a reply and I'm, I gave you a little thumbnail as I was telling you what the my points would be about these different issues. But now I'm going to read you his second commentary. 
Hello, thank you for your response. You don't seem to know the meaning of the word context in relation to literature. This is why when I pointed out that your interpretation is out of context, you assumed I meant some parts of scripture are not valid. Okay, so I, I just have to ask myself, is he saying now he's agreeing in those passages of Matthew, Mark, and John still apply that if you don't become a disciple, as John 8 proves, and you don't learn to be free of sin, uh, you're going to still be saved if you don't go through all these things? Because Jesus says, if you don't get free of sin, you're still in bondage to sin. So you have to become free. So is that still a principle? Or is Mark 9, 42 to 47 still true that you have to go to heaven, Maine, and, and uh, or you're going to go to hell whole? So it's not faith alone there. It, so I'm not sure what he means. Reading your comments above makes it very clear that you don't consider Apostle Paul's words to be scripture, the words of God. Okay, so this is where I think he's, he, that was just an intro that I, I, he didn't prove anything I can tell yet. Reading your comments above makes it very clear that you don't consider Apostle Paul's words to be scripture, the words of God. Well, I've done a Berean testing. We'll get to that later. You make outlandish claims such as several books in the New Testament are correcting errors in other books in the New Testament that were written by Paul. No, I didn't say it. I was quoting Augustine saying that Second Peter, James, John, and Jude, all four, two are bishops, two are apostles, right? Peter, well, Peter, James, John. Yeah, two are apostles, two are bishops of the church, and they all agreed that there was a message that had to be refuted, according to Augustine, and it was the doctrine of faith alone, and that's in Augustine's work called Faith and Works. And I gave him, and I gave him a link even to go to look at that passage and re read the whole thing. Okay. Your comments are too far out and away from any serious theological discussion. Okay, so I, I'm, I think doing Berean testing is never going to be far out. You're just comparing Paul to what's written before, but regardless. I'm not trying to insult or hurt your feelings. Many times when people say that, that's exactly what they're going to do. Uh, but anyway, even though your comments about Paul insulted our Lord Jesus Christ and all of his elected apostles who wrote the words of God. Woo! I, I'm, I'm, I'm taken aback, but this is why I'm putting this out there also for the people who are in the same view as I have about Paul when you do the Berean testing, is you got to be prepared to be yourself insulted, okay? And uh, it's going to get worse, though. So you got to really have a tough skin. And uh, I love this man, and what I'm trying to do is help him find Christ. I'm, find, I'm trying to help all the covenant theology people and all the people lost in this doctrine, which the church truly had refuted it did was these four bishops two bishops and two apostles that were speaking out against faith alone you don't see it in second peter because you're not reading second peter 2 in light of and then reading that chapter 3 in light of what you've just read in chapter 2 i, I i'm just getting a heads up and i'm not going to go into that here today i just want to uh, show you what a berean testing is and why it's valid despite when you hear these kind of accusations don't be intimidated that's exactly the wrong response because you're obeying god and luke says you have a more noble character when you test paul against the scripture that came before him as we'll uh, do uh, we'll show in the video but it's in Acts 17. let's continue he goes on all of the books in the new, De new testament are in perfect harmony about salvation now i'm going to pause there so, so since he's made everything about the crucifixion what he's actually saying is it's harmony once you know the crucifixion changed everything so it all makes sense to him he can he can hold on to paul and he can hold on to jesus but not his words prior to the cross that are inconsistent with the faith alone doctrine that is adopted after the cross do you see the point okay there are no contradictions or even the slightest disagreements among those who wrote the inspired words of god well is moses included i have to ask i just have to pause because clearly paul says moses says yahweh gave the law in exodus 20 four times it's mentioned in giving the ten commandments yahweh's name is invoked as a source of each of these specific paragraphs of the of the ten but paul says it was not given by god it was given by angels in galatians 3 19 and then later when the, when he's dealing with the foolish galatians who want to keep shabbat he then says you're why you're being in bondage again to the weak and beggarly the word there is translated in English, King KJV, is elements, but Vin, uh, Vincent is correct in his commentary. The elements were the angels who were in control of the angel of the elemental spirits. If you had read the Pharisee work 
of 150 BC known as the Book of Jubilees. And so Paul is invoking the Book of Jubilees concept that inferior angels had actually given the law. And by the way, this, this uh, Pharisee who wrote the Book of Jubilees was setting up the principle that since God's law wasn't actually given by God, Yahweh, but by inferior angels, that therefore the oral law that they claimed they were the repositories of, that's where the, uh, that was where the true, in, tru, truly inspired word of God came to the, the Pharisees' ancestors, whoever they might have been. They were the ones who had received the oral law, and now they claimed they were the repository of this much more authoritative oral law. That's important for Christians to understand why Paul says those things. But clearly, it's impossible to believe that there's not disagreements uh, uh, with, with with the words of God and who that who authored that. And Jesus himself quotes that it's Yahweh spoken. Okay, so he said, uh, you know, as the Lord, God Yahweh had spoken, and he's quoting God Yahweh many times, although it's translated as Lord. So he is quoting it as if Yahweh actually gave it, and not angels who are weak and wet, beggarly. Uh, uh, angels, okay, as Paul describes them in Galatians 4, 9, when you use Vincent to translate him, because Vincent knows that book of Jubilees, he even cites and quotes from the book of Jubilees, so you, you can see that, and I have a whole, a whole video on the book of Jubilees. Let's continue. Your, your claim that Paul was corrected by James is suggesting that God corrected his own words, because Paul, both Paul and James wrote God's word. Well, that's, an, that's I'm just going to pause there, is that's assuming something that's not in evidence yet. You have to test the way to test Paul is you have to not assume he's part of God's word. You have to test him against the word that came before. So the whole rule of apostasy is out the window if you can't test somebody who claims he's from the word, he's the word of God when you don't have him in the in the word. And I suppose you, Christians, we don't know this, but if you ask a theologian, when did the canon get formed? They're going to tell you it was in 393 at Hippo. This was led by Augustine of Hippo. And... Um, and so, but none of the records survived. They, they are only recorded what the result was by a later conference, 60 years later, says these were the books they picked and they match our current books. But if you go to Metzger and you ask him, what's the canon before uh, by 180, it's only the words of Jesus. And the uh, letters are treated as non-inspired works. And that included Paul. Metzger says that's definitely still true of Paul. So we're going to do a video on that soon. So we'll, we'll cover that issue and we'll show you Metzger's commentary on that. But I have a, uh, it's in our article called JWO, uh, the JWO Canon through 180 AD online. Anyway, then this is where I, I, I have to say he, what he's going to say next. Your comments above contain blasphemy against God. So he is saying, I have committed a insult on God, Yahweh himself, which by the way, the only way you can do that is you actually have to use the name Yahweh. I did not do that. So uh, I, I think people should not say such things and post them when they have not yet listened to everything the other person said. So I don't know how he can know my heart that I was insulting Yahweh. That is absolutely not the case. I love Yahweh. I worship Yahweh. He's my God. He's the only true God. Jesus said the Father is the only true God. So I disagree, okay, vehemently, but I'm not going to get angry. And this is what I want to, I'm trying to show uh, people who are, you going to get insulted this way yourself. Don't respond. Don't be defensive. Just say, it's, you know, it's not true. You know your own heart. So you don't have to worry that somebody uses words against you. Just be calm and just tell the, tell what your side of the story is. And hopefully you're trying to say, I'm trying to, I'm trying to tell this person things that will help him get on a better course with God. He thinks he's, uh, you know, in the right place. May, may, you know, I'm not his judge, but I can just say covenant theology is teaching contrary to Mark 9, Mark 9, 42 to 47. It's teaching contra contrary to John 8, 30 to 47. It's teaching contrary to Luke 8, 18. Okay. It's te teaching contrary to John, uh, James 2, 24. So these are the words of God that are, that are much more important than, anything that Paul wrote, okay? And you need to test Paul by these things. And and Bishop James, just so you know, he is not, he's he is a bishop, but he has a superior position over Paul. And the the original apostles, it's sometimes said they picked John, uh, J James, but there was a tradition in quotes from, maybe it was the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, that what they were told is Jesus said, 
they said uh, when he was departing and just before he sends, he actually says to them, they ask, you know, well, where, who, who shall we follow? Who should we go? And he says, go to James because the heaven and earth were brought into existence for his benefit. <laughs> so that meant this man was very important in Jesus' mind. So that is actually a plausible possibility because everybody's acting, even J Paul in Acts 21, he acts like James is his superior. And James gives him in, in verb tenses that are commands, not optional the suggestions. You got to, you're going to do this to prove to everyone you're not an apostate. That's what he is talking about in Acts 21 after verse 20, ver, from verse 21 down. So anyway, don't take offense when people say things like this. And I, I, I hope and pray that uh, what I'm going to sh show to this man is it's not a blasphemy. It's obeying God's word to test Paul, just as we're advised in Acts 17. And if you conclude Paul's false, it doesn't mean you're a blasphemer. It means he didn't pass the test against God's word before. Okay, let's continue. Salvation is by a genuine faith, which is guaranteed to produce good works. Uh, now, see, now there he's already gone against what Jesus said right there in Mark 9, verse 42 to 47. A believer in me who falls into sin, okay, is you have to go to heaven maimed or hell, you're going to go to hell whole. Jesus isn't making this threat idly, like you're going to, because you had faith, you're automatically going to be saved. No, that's the whole point of Mark 9, 42 to 47. So you got to go to heaven maimed or hell whole. Therefore, it is not guaranteed you will have good works. Correct? Then in John 8, verse 30 to 47, what's going on there? You got believers in Jesus who say, who, who just says, you know, if you continue in my word, that's that's right there. Verse, uh, look at 8, 30 to 33, right in there. If you continue in my word, you will be free indeed. And they go, we've never been in bondage to anyone. Jesus says, if you're continuing in sin, you're in bondage to sin, you're a slave of sin. And then they go, we've never been a slave because our father is Abraham. And, and then he says, you have not done the works of Abraham. See, there's works <laughs> thrown in the mix. And then Jesus keeps insisting, you, you know, you need to become my disciples. And they keep refusing. And, and, and then Jesus says, you want to kill me. And then finally, Jesus says, you are of your, your father, the devil. They went from faith, began well. They were even, you know, he knew they had accepted the step moving forward. But they were not saved. That's the whole point uh, th that I was trying to make in the video about covenant theology. And now he's just simply only looking at Paul. That's what I, I can only suggest. suggest that he thinks the crucifixion changed the words of Jesus so you don't have to actually follow or listen to anything Jesus says because he never discusses the passages that were the predicate of my critique of covenant theology, those three passages, and then the book of, of, uh, of James because he's a superior. Even Paul acknowledges by his behavior in Acts 21, his superior is James. And if the tradition of the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew is correct, Jesus actually told them to go to James and he would be their administrator and bishop. But I digress. Anyway, those who claim to have faith but do not manifest any good works do not have real faith. Well, that that's I, I would say that's probably right, but it doesn't mean the fact you don't have good works as a, as a Christian means you're not a Christian. And that's wrong because Jesus exactly acknowledges to the contrary, both in Mark 9, both, also in uh, John 8, and also in uh, the, the uh, story of Zacchaeus. I mean, you know, he he only actually, there's no mention that he had faith, but it's presumably did, uh, but he had faith and then he promised to do works. So it, it's, but he could fall back. He could, he could change his mind. I mean, so he's saying if, if he really had faith, he'll always follow through, but we know that's not true from Mark 9 and John 8. That's why these passages have to be brought back into the consciousness of Christians and stop teaching faith alone, which is was a heresy according to the earliest church. The four, what, what were they? Second Peter, look at Second Peter chapter two, Second Peter, uh, excuse me, uh, Jude, take a look there, take a look at James, take a look at the book of John, which I just showed you. It's clear as day from John eight, you have a faith alone that gets crushed when it refuses to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. See, that's why he, I would have suggested, you, he, before he re responded, he should have thoroughly read my disproofs of covenant theology from the verses I was quoting and discussing in the video. I have a feeling he just read the title. A lot of people do that, but whatever, he didn't engage. He's never engaged on the texts I've said and clearly said uh, anything, but it's just not, they're, they're not relevant. He's only, the only thing he's given me is he's thinking they're not relevant because the crucifixion changed everything. That's all you, I can conclude. 
Then he says, salvation is not by works. Then what do you, salvation, according to Paul, is by justification, but by faith. But James clearly contradicts that. And he says in James 2, verse 24, justification is, is by works. He contradicts James. So he, he's saying he doesn't see contradictions, but he himself is now contradicting James. But by the kind of faith that produces good works. Uh, but it's not necessary. It won't necessarily continue. And I just proved that from John 8 and again from Mark 9. That's What did that, why did G, James say this word? What did James mean in Acts 21 asking Paul about the charge that Paul was teaching apostasy against Moses? Those are his words. Now, just tell you real brief, the word apostasy means to turn people away from the law given Moses by Yahweh. Okay. Here is the actual passage in Greek the, with interlinear English from Mount C's reverse interlinear. You can get this at BibleGateway.com, Acts 21, 21. So I've highlighted it there. I don't know if you can see the word, so I'm going to actually uh, make it big here. See, that is the word forsake. You can see the word apostasy. So now that arrow, keep that arrow in mind. So James tells Paul, but they were told about you, meaning the elders, the apostles, about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to apostatize against Moses. All right. Telling them not to circumcise their children and not to walk according to our customs. And you can just read the book of Romans chapter 7. And you see he's saying that uh, the Jews themselves are now freed from their husband. They are now free to marry another. And they were, therefore, there's a kartarge, a destruction of the law between them. The severance between the husband and the wife is by the death of the husband, uh, which is hard to explain what he meant by that. But the, the death of the husband of the, uh, the people of Israel frees them now to join onto another who has no law for them. And that's why a lot of people think that the law is gone because of, of that passage in Romans 7, as to Jews too. And Paul also saying, says in Galatians, there's no more Jew or Gentile. So he did get rid of circumcision because if there's no more Jew, there's no more sons of Israel. There is no more basis for having any more Abrahamic covenant for, for that purpose. All right. So uh, let's continue. Look on the right side. Yahweh on the law. How long is the law to exist? It's eternal for all generations is repeated 11 times. You see all those verses there? Exodus 27, 21. Please go look it up if you don't agree with me, if you think I'm wrong. But the point is this. Can a law eternal for all generations be discarded because it's a tutor? by Somebody just saying, I've, I, I've been to the third heaven. I'm talking to, uh, I can't repeat anything I'm told. Uh, this is in uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 3 to 6. I, it's, illicit, Ill, uh, it's illicit for me to tell you, and it's incomprehensible what I'm hearing, but I'm hearing things that Third Heaven tells me that these provisions about this whole thing, eternal for all generations, this wasn't even given by God. But let's just look at what he says in one part of, of Galatians 3.24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that, faith has come. We are no longer under schoolmaster. Could be more clear. That schoolmaster that was eternal for all generations is now gone. This is apostasy 101. And then in Galatians 3, 19, when you look a little bit earlier, he says the law was given by angels through a mediator. And so far, you don't know just reading that. Is that going to be a bad thing? Yes, it's a very bad thing. Uh, this, by the way, comes from the book of Jubilees, an apocryphal work that said, yes, the law was given by angels. And then it identifies these other angels that are inferior, which are the angels that control the elements of wind, water and fire. Well, guess what? Paul says in Galatians 4, 9, that the L, the the uh, why do you he tells the Galatians who want to do Shabbat? Why do you uh, want to be in bondage again to the weak and beggarly? And it's translated in England to the King James as elements but it means elemental celestial beings, according to Vincent. I'm not making it up. Based on when he, he's saying, if you look at the book of Jubilees, that apocryphal work by a, a Pharisee in 150 BC, that created this impression that God, Yahweh, didn't even give the law. And that was, by the way, to build up that there's such a thing as an oral law, because if you have a written law that really didn't come from God, Yahweh, the Pharisees were saying, well, we've received and have the, rep the re reservoir what's the oral law that was give given directly by Yahweh. So they made their story more authoritative but that's all going on here in galatians and that is straight apostasy right out of the playbook for an apostasy anybody who would teach this who would be sentenced to death uh under the law of the laws of israel under the De deuteronomic law of De deuteronomy 13 1 to 10. Now i'm going to show you what apostasy is from the normative protestant perspective and i'm going to pick actually a reformed presbyterian theologian that's where 
I spent many years in the Presbyterian Church, Reformed, and this was a major person of Reformed theology. And he actually wrote a book called Systematic Theology in 1871. I picked up this book off of books.google.com. You can find it there too. Go to page 763, Charles Hodge, Systematic Theology. And this is what he says. If the apostles taught anything contrary to the authenticated revelation of God, they were to be rejected. What is he talking about? Talking about what I'm telling you, apostasy. So let's look at another Protestant source, very mainstream, Norman Geisler in his uh, encyclopedia called Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics by Norman Geisler, 1999. So you can get this uh, for reasonable cost at Kindle. And here's what he says. He's talking about uh, the, the rule of apostasy, but he never tells you the word apostasy is what he's talking about. He just tells you the principle of whatever came last has to be protested by what came before. But anyway, it's still valid. One such test was the authenticity of a book. That is, does the book tell the truth about God and his world as known from previous revelations? God cannot contradict himself. Second Corinthians 1, 17 to 18. So Paul even has the understanding that if you say something today that is contradictory of before, it can't be from God. So that means that Paul would be welcoming that you test him by the words that came before him. That's what he's going to tell you. No book with false claims can be the word of God, clearly, unequivocally. Now you're going to say, well, why is it? People say to me, it's in the word of God, so it must be true. No, that's not how you determine something that God, God's going to explain to you in a minute why he allows false prophets. He literally says, I allow them. So he's not going to exclude them. I allow them. It tells you. It's to prove you, to see, to test you, see if you love me with your whole heart, mind, and soul. So I'm going to read you that in a second. It's in this very passage of Deuteronomy. Moses stated the principle about prophets generally that, quote, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes true, concerning which is spoken of you to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you've not known, such as a god who has no food laws, a god who allows you to eat meat sacrificed idols, stuff like that, and let us serve them you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. Now, does Luke commend as virtuous and noble the Bereans testing whether Paul was consistent with prior holy writings? So in other words, did he show us people who were following the rules to determine apostasy or not? Let's read this in Acts 17, verses 10 to 12, NIV in Berea. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. So by the way, I'm going to show you in a second what Paul taught in the book of Acts. Very normative, very pro-Jesus, very consistent with Jesus. So we're going to look at that in a second. So there's no reason at this point that the Bereans would have any be on guard to anything because Paul, Paul is teaching in Luke's presence very normative statements. I'll show that to you in a second. Uh, what's important here is notice that the Breen Jews are more noble doing what is so they're supposed to do, which is check if Paul is consistent with the scripture that came before him. And they did this every day. So this is something you could do every morning, get up and make an exercise to prove that you are being diligent towards God's word, that you test everything who Paul says. He says many things that are good. You know, love is kind, love is wonderful. Yes, he does that. That's but remember, Jesus warned us about wolves in sheep's clothing. What would you expect? Sheep's clothing means they're going to have nice verbs, verses like, you know, love is kind, love is wonderful. But what is the wolf part of it? This is the wolf. Here's the wolf right here. This is apostasy. Okay. All right. So that's the, this is a test for you. you. You have to go through it. I'm just showing you how I would recommend you do it. And uh, I just want to tell you... Um, uh, when we get back now to the issue of Paul and the apostasy in Acts 21 is definitely what Paul is being confronted with is a claim that he's guilty of apostasy of Moses. This is the rumor that the apostles had heard, and they now want him to prove he isn't. So just to show you something is you tell me in your own heart, is Paul being straight with them? Now, at the time of Acts 21 is down here, Blue Letter Bible, 57 AD. Let's take a look at all the, uh, this is the expert opinion, uh, this is summarized at Wikipedia, the expert opinion of when Paul's epistles were written. So anything that overlaps 57 AD, let's see what that is. So Galatians, he wrote Galatians, that's 48 AD. He wrote First Thessalonians as early as 49 AD up to 51, that's, that's written before Acts 21. First Corinthians, 53 to 54, 55 to 66, second. Romans, 55 to 57, 
all those dates come within that. Philippians 57 AD comes within it. Philemon comes within that. It's still there. Second Thessalonians 51, Colossians 57. The only one that falls out of it is technically Ephesians. But I, I happen to believe it's earlier, but that's regard, regardless. Uh, then the others are not there. So the only ones that fall out, according to the experts here, the, the Pauline epistles, is Ephesians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So everything else he's written, his entire corpus, essentially, except uh, I would say Ephesians is a major work. That is not uh, agreed there. But I think it was there, but that's that's a, my dispute. So this is what you have to measure him against. This is everything he said. Is he acting honest with James in Acts 21, 21? Given what you know, he's written in all those works. Is he being straight? He says, so uh, James says, uh, they are informed of you that you teach all the Jews, which are among the Gentiles to forsake, apostatize against Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. And indeed, he says in Romans 7, the Jews are freed from the law. It was uh, what the husband died, and now they're released from the law. Verse 22, what is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that you are come. Do therefore that this, what we say to you. He's commanding him. And by the way, that shows you he's superior to Paul. At least that's in his position as bishop, right? We have four men which have a vow to them. Take them, take and purify yourself with them and be at charges with them. So pay their way. There's a fee involved that they may shave their heads. It's a part of the Nazarite vow. And all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou uh, thyself also walk orderly and keep the law. He does exactly what he's told. He says nothing that he believed the law was given by angels. It was a tutor. All the things that you believe and rely upon, he doesn't even have the courage or the guts to say anything to James. He knows he's wrong. So he's he's basically just com committing deception. And, I, you know, you decide if you think I'm wrong. You think he's, why does he follow through and do this? When you you know he doesn't teach any of these things, and he should not be giving the confirmation that he keeps the law. A law, he says, a tutor is dead and gone. Okay, now I'm going to stop the clip I'm uh, using. Uh, this was the next slide, and I wanted to change the commentary there and bring it back to what we were talking about with uh, Dr. Kurosh. So uh, I'm going to throw this back at Dr. Kurosh. I'm going to show you two more things that Paul does in the book of Acts that totally legitimizes me him if this is all he ever said and we never had any of his epistles listen to this paul under oath in front of luke told king agrippa that this was paul's gospel of the gentiles acts 26 verse 19 to 20 whereupon o king agrippa i was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision but showed first unto them of damascus and at jerusalem and throughout all the coast of judea and then to the gentiles so he said he's this is his gospel to both jew and gentile that they should do what Repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Acts 26, 19, verses 20. That's why Luke in all of his gospel has all kinds of messages about the believing seed that uh, falls into temptation. It, it dies and withered and is gone. And that there's this, uh, the, uh, the final seed. There's another seed that's uh, in, in, overwhelmed by the, the world's occupying his time and he produces no fruit. He's also lost. And then the, third, the fourth and final seed is a, one who a good and noble heart Paul says there is no such thing, but Jesus thinks and Luke thinks there's somebody who has a good and noble heart, produces fruit uh, to endurance to the end. And that's the one who's saved. And that's what Jesus is extolling us to follow. Not the believer who just believes and doesn't produce much fruit and then he dies. That's not the guy. And that's right in Luke's uh, version of the parable of the sower. A believer dies and is withered and is gone. The only one saved is the guy who produces works to the end. You see the point? I could, I could cite many other verses. But that's Paul. He's teaching the right message here. So what is he doing? He's he's deceiving Luke, who know who has a different gospel, the gospel of Jesus. And Paul knows that, and he's pretending when he's around Luke to be a totally different being. A chameleon is is he defends it by the way in First Corinthians uh, nine. He'll be a Jew to a Jew, a Gentile to a Gentile. He'll be all things to all men, so I can please, please everyone so that by any means possible, I will lead people to Christ. So he doesn't care. In, in Romans 3, 7, if by my lie, I'm, you know, if by lie I'm bringing glory to God, why am I still judged a sinner? That's his words. People can make up stuff they want all around it, but it's not there. It's That's his own words. He's rationalization. Roman Catholic Church took and ran with that and created a whole teaching of casuistry. It's lawful, it's lawful to, to think about the end justifies the means just as Paul C. teaches. I have one more verse to show you. All right, so now prepare yourself for the ultimate 
What's happened? Luke was present in Acts 21. He sees that Paul deflects the charge of apostasy against Moses by doing exactly what Bishop James tells him to do. And it'll prove to everyone that you keep the law, that you're not an apostate, right? And then we saw here in his speech before King Agrippa, he says his message to Jews and Gentiles was they have to repent and turn to God to do works meet for repentance. That's not in his, his epistles, my friend, not in his epistles that this is his gospel. This, this is a different gospel. This is the gospel of Jesus, the gospel that Paul knows Luke is sold out to, to Jesus Christ. This is where you can prove Luke was completely deceived by Paul. But this, Paul says, I confess, and this is in court, to Festus, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. He doesn't even believe the law was written by God. He says so in Galatians. It was written by angels or weak and beggarly angels. <laughs> okay. And why does this, why can I say for a fact I know Luke was deceived? Because Luke tells you this is what he knows is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than the smallest part of a single letter in the law to lose its force. And this is not part of the Sermon on the Mount where Matthew 5, 17 came and people make a lot about Jesus having said, I came to perform the law perfectly and they mistranslated it as to fulfill all things. It's He says right there, he's keeping the law uh, completely perfectly. That's all it says. But here he doesn't even make that secondary remark. Here he's just telling you factually and this is what Luke would believe. So if if he hears this, he's thinking Paul's completely consistent with Jesus, the Jesus he knows, the Jesus he knows from this gospel. When he's writing the book of Acts, he's already written his gospel, just so you know. He's writing it to the same person, and he's, he addresses the beginning of Acts as most excellent Theophilus. I told you the, the story of Jesus in the past. Now I'm going to tell you the story of the church. This is after that. So he is completely sold out to Jesus. That's why when I sh show you this verse from Luke, he believes the law will not go fade away. It's not a, a, a tutor. It's not, he knows nothing of what Paul teaches, nothing. His gospel that he knows is completely adverse to Paul. And yet he, Paul was willing to deceive him. This is deception. And, and the honesty of Luke is just so obvious because why would he put this in here? It's embarrassing if this was false. And it was in writing and all those other writings. It was not true. The, the, law, the law is fading away. It's a tutor. It's, it's a, a bondage, actually. And oh, so clearly Paul defrauded him. Now, that's important because we were to do it Berean testing. So what, what happens is you can't trust everything Paul says and take it to the gospel because he's willing to what? If by my lie, Romans 3, 7, the glory of God is advanced, why am I still judge a sinner? And then he says, I, I act deliberately to seem like I'm a, a Jew when I'm around Jews, or maybe someone like Luke, who's a, maybe he's a, clearly a Gentile, but he's of the Jewish faith and he knows how to translate Hebrew because that's what he's, what he's doing with his gospel. So he is a, a person he's willing to deceive because he's somebody he wants to win over. He's willing to deceive James. He's going to go ahead and do that Nazarite vow, even though he doesn't believe in the gosh darn thing there. The book of Numbers. What? You're crazy, James. That's what he should have said. That's a book given by angels that are weak and beggarly. Why do you want to be in bondage, James, James to them? And he could have given this speech. He gives a Romans 7 to the Jews there. He says, hey, you know, the, the, hus the husband of the Jewish people has died. Don't even ask what that might mean. And when he died, the, the law between them that binds the husband to the wife was then catargate. It was destroyed. That's how he get, gets got rid, of, got rid of the law between Jews and Gentiles. Excuse me, between Jews and Yahweh. So anyway, I hope this will help this person who, to realize, uh, Dr. Karosh, that it is not incorrect to test Paul by the word of God. And that by the word of God, you have to include Luke. OK, I mean, if you and I believe he believes this is what he was told. So is he inspired to record all these facts? And why did God have him? This is what I think is a miracle of God. Luke, who thinks he's and you cannot dispute that Luke is defending Paul, making him look as good as he possibly can. Right. And he believes these are all truly how Paul believes. Right. So you can't claim he's a conspirator with Doug. <laughs> he, he is blowing up Paul without intending to. That's the point. And so am I to be called a blasphemer when you can see on the face of things, unless you blind and stick your, eye, your, your fingers in your eyes and you blind yourself so you can't see this? This is clearly a good test. Bereans are 
doing a more noble thing by testing Paul against the word of God that came before, testing even Paul against Paul, meaning, Paul, how can you say these things when you previously said something the opposite? See, that's fair because now is he playing a double game? All right, everyone, I hope this helps Mr. Uh, Dr. Kroosh, and I hope any of you who are still on the fence about whether it's better to follow Jesus or this man, Paul. I think this whole episode should be a real eye-opener. God bless. Take care. Ciao. Bye.